14. Luke chapter 14. And uh, though I won't deal with every verse, I would like to start reading at verse number 12. And if I could get you to stand with me in honor of God's word, I would appreciate it very much. And uh, this is a tough uh, chapter. And I was repenting this morning, but I really have been trying to preach out of it. I'm not sure about it today, but I'm looking to the Lord. That's the best place anyway. Chapter 14 of Luke, verse number 12. He said also to the man who had invited him, When you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. When one of those who reclined at table with him heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. But he said to him, a man once gave a great banquet, invited many. And at the time for the, as, and at the, time for the banquet, he sent his servants to say to those who have been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I bought a field. I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. Another said, I bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to examine them. Please have me excused. Another said, I've married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house became angry and said to the servant, Go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city. Bring in the poor, crippled, blind, and lame. And the servant said, Sir... What you have commanded has been done, and there still there is room. The master said to the servant, Go out to the highways and hedges. Compel people to come in, that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. Father, we ask you to bless now the reading of your word, I pray that you will open our hearts to be able to speak the Word of God clearly and understandably. And Lord, only those things that you would have me to say would be said. Give us ears to hear what the Spirit says to the church today. We love you. We bless you. We praise you for it now. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. And I want to say to you that sometimes uh, it is difficult to know exactly where you're going to go when you're preaching. Unless you're doing a series and you know what the next scripture is, then that makes it pretty easy to know what scripture you're dealing with. But this week, uh, when I went to bed Wednesday evening, I I had a big question mark. Where do I go from here? And I had no answers. Though I have to tell you that Wednesday night, as we were talking about uh, using the scriptures as a basis for our remarks that we preached on last Sunday morning, we just told the rest of the story, how that God's call, the upward call, and as I, I was reading scripture after scripture that talks about it, I couldn't help but to see that God calls us, it's an upward call in two senses. One, it comes from heaven, and two, it calls us higher. And I saw where God is calling us to a place of blessing, always to bless. I thought of that when we were singing this morning about grace unending. God is a God of blessing, and he calls us to be recipients of that blessing. And so I went to bed Wednesday night saying, Lord, I could choose. I got a whole book of sermons. Right here it is. I can choose any place, but I would love to know what you would have me to do this coming Sunday. 
And when I woke up Thursday morning, I woke about half awake. It was rolling through my mind. What is the number one hindrance for people serving the Lord? What is the number one thing that keeps a person from really giving their best to God? And uh, I, knew, I know what that answer is. It's the one thing other than Christ that we are living our life for. That's the thing that keeps us from giving our best to God. It can be our work. It can be our family. In fact, I was surprised. I found some uh, illustrations that I had in my file and the barter. Uh, uh, George, uh, what's his name, had made the, done the uh, survey and he came up with this conclusion. Americans put family ahead of God. I've always believed that. I see it in the church even many times. Family comes first. Not so with God. Keeps us from putting God first. God will not share that number one position with anybody or anything. The Bible says that God is a jealous God and will not take second fiddle or second place in our life. And, and so that wasn't a surprise, but it wasn't what I wanted to, to speak about. But it is what I am speaking about, how that we, we have to make sure. One of my life verses, I picked this up when I was a student at Bible College and attending First Assembly in Lakeland, Florida. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. That's been my motto now for uh, many, many years. And I, I can testify, God honors his word. He watches over his word to perform it. And as I seek God first, seek first the kingdom, seek the righteousness in my life, God will take care of every other need that may come up in my life. And so if you're living life for any other reason than for Christ, that's what's keeping you from putting Jesus first in your life. I believe more than adultery, more than drugs, more than stealing the cares of life, living life, keeps more people from serving God than any of the big sins that we talk about. These are not sins. And no one can say they're sins. But whatever comes between us and God becomes sin in our life. God wants to be number one in our life. In fact, that's the only way that it's going to work. Luke said the cares of life, and Mark said it. Choke out the word of God, and the fruit never comes to maturity. The cares of life, paying the rent or the house payment, keeping the cars going, the kids with their supplies in school, living life can sap the very life out of you. And in many cases in America, I'm, I'm afraid that's exactly what happens. It's not living, really. It's existing. But God doesn't want us to just survive. He wants us to thrive. Amen? He wants us to be fruitful. And even in your old age, you can bear fruit. I love that, don't you? There's never a place where you stop be, being fruitful and doing what God has called you to do. So these are not sins, but they're things that come in and take God's place in our life. And Jesus is invited to a feast, 
And as he, he observed some things and was sharing them with a person who had invited him, he said, the next time you give a feast, don't call just your friends, the rich people, and those who can reciprocate and invite you over and return the favor. But go and find the blind and the cripple and the maim, those who could never repay you. And then you will be blessed and reciprocated, recompensed at the resurrection of the just. In other words, God will pay you for it. And here's the principle there. Bless others and you will be blessed. I want to say it again. Bless others and you will be blessed. And if you many we want to skip that part. We just want God to bless us. We're not looking to bless someone else. But God says if you bless others, those who cannot help themselves, if you close your ears to the cry of the poor, you shall cry also yourself and not be heard. But if you listen to the cry of a world that has lost its way, of a civilization that is going down the tubes, that is looking for reality and meaning to life, and you begin to reach out to them, and you bless those around you, expecting nothing in return, God will pay you back, and he will do, do it better than anyone else will do it. Amen? Amen. You ought to be shouting right now. Bless others, you will be blessed. Well, you say, Pastor, I'm not being blessed. Who are you blessing? Bless others. And a, a man that was at the feast overheard the conversation. And he said in verse 15, Blessed are those who eat bread in the kingdom of God. And there is great truth in this. In fact, I turned over to, I believe, Revelation chapter 18, and I was reading about the marriage supper of the Lamb and how the saints have made themselves ready and they're permitted to dress in those white garments of what? Righteous deeds. Righteous deeds. Things that we have done for others. And we are dressed and ready, and we are sitting at the table for the uh, celebrating the consummation of our relationship with God. Oh, what a day that's going to be. It's not going to be Kentucky fried chicken, but it's going to be fried chicken, all right. And it's going to be not on steroids. It's going to be the pure good stuff. And we're going to enjoy ourselves. And when we get all the chicken we can eat, we're going to have chocolate cake and chocolate pie and chocolate ice cream and chocolate brownies. You name it, God's going to have a full array of it. And we're going to celebrate with him. The day of recompense has come and we have made ourselves ready, and we're not worried about hell because we are sitting at the Father's house in heaven. Can you say amen? amen. Oh, man, it's, we, our greatest day are, is ahead, not behind us. And so that great, it's a great truth, the man said. Blessed are those. But listen, he didn't talk about blessing anybody else. There is great truth in this statement, but misunderstanding of who will be eating bread in the kingdom. And our focus today is on the invitation to the feast. The invitation is to a great feast. Notice that's what the scripture says. It was a great banquet, verse 16. It would have to be if it's going to be a, a picture of that day when we sat at the table with a master 
It would have to be a great banquet. And to, it illustrates that which is coming in the kingdom. And banquets in the, in the New Testament are always at significant times. Like the prodigal son returning home. And the father said, kill the fatted calf. Let's celebrate. My son was dead, but now he's alive. He was lost, but now he's found. And they begin to, to, to celebrate and make merry. And you know how it was when the old elder brother came in. And he was upset because they were celebrating this brother of his who had wasted his living His inheritance with righteous living. But the Father's forgiven it all. Hallelujah. Grace unending. Grace greater than all of our sins. That's the Father we serve. And so banquets, the marriage feast, even in this chapter, if you read the earlier verses. But everyone at the feast, at this feast, will be blessed. Many are invited. No matter what their past has has been, they have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, and they're invited to the feast. And it says many of them were invited. Every testimony there will be about the grace of our God extended toward us. We're not going to talk about our accomplishments We're going to talk about his accomplishments. How that he found me in my mess. And he brought me out and set me on a solid foundation. And changed my life forevermore. I was going toward hell and God turned me around. And now I'm going toward heaven. Amen. And so we've been redeemed. I think about that scripture in the Song of Solomon. He brought me to his banqueting table, and his banner over me is love. I didn't have to bring anything. I didn't have to get some groceries and cook them. He's prepared everything. He's everything. All things are ready, he said. I've prepared it for you. God wants us to be there. He's invited us to come. He brought me, and his banner over me is love. And we'll be sitting at the master's table with abundant provision. We get a little taste when we sit at his table today and feast on the good things of God. And remember how God took our place, paid the penalty for our sins. And so the invitation, what happened in those days... That there was like today, you, every once in a while you get a, a message in the, in the snail mail. And it says, reserve the date. In other words, they'll tell you a couple of months ahead of time or free. And just mark this date and keep it. Because you're invited to a special occasion. And then when the day came and everything was ready, the master of the feast He brought his servants in and said, all things are ready. Come to the feast. And he sent them out with this message. And to his amazement, they all alike began to make excuses. Notice verse 18. But they all alike began to make excuses. Many, many Bible scholars that I've read after this first group that was invited were the leadership of Israel. Listen, they had been entrusted with God's word. They had the covenants. They had the prophets who had ministered to them. God had visited them at times, and they had a great and rich heritage spiritually. And now God is saying, now's the time to come into the kingdom. And the call goes out. And they all begin to make excuses. There's the businessman's excuse. My wealth. I, I, uh, in Luke 14, 18, he, he has bought a field. I must go and see it. 
Now, that sounds kind of suspicious, doesn't it? I'd like to sell that man some property in Florida, some swamp land that I know about. If he'll buy it before sight unseen, I would love to sell him something. Was this an investment? Was it real estate? Was it bought in order to expand his farm and operation? Or what was it? But whatever it was, his wealth stood between him and God. And he, he, he I cannot come. An excuse. Then there's the, the, the working man's excuse. In the 19th verse, another had bought five pair of oxen. And wanted to try them out. I've seen God bless people with jobs who turned around and used the jobs to be an excuse why they couldn't serve God. And I said, whoa, you mean God's blessing is a stumbling block to you? You mean because God gave you this job, you can't do anything for God now, you can't even attend church. And, well, you don't have to go. Well, I don't agree with that either. I believe you'll want to go if you're serving God. If you don't go, pretty soon you won't want to go, you know. And so the working man's excuse, I've got to work. That's the unanswerable excuse. And there's some people that will work, they're workaholics, present company excluded. They work all the time, and it consumes their life, and they have no time for God, and they make the excuse, the working man's excuse. And then there's that third one, the wife excuse. I can't believe a man's just married and already henpecked. Somebody told me there are only two kinds of husbands, henpecked and liars. I don't know if that's true or not. But listen, if you have a wife like mine who has never stood between you and God's work, you are a blessed man who joins with you and becomes a partner in the ministry, a true partner. Now, I don't count her as, as pastor of the church, but she's a vital part of it. I tell her I'm the head. She says, I'm a neck that turns a head. <laughs> so you better treat me fine. Okay, I know God will turn the blessing off if you don't. And so he's, he'll, he'll take us to the woodshed if we mistreat our, our wives. Very important. Now, I give my wife a hard time. Some of you know that sometimes. In jest, of course. <laughs> Always in jest. But he couldn't because he had a wife. Now, he may have been talking about that scripture over in, was it Deuteronomy or Exodus? It said, when you marry a wife, you should take off from work for one year and stay home and entertain your wife. Betty's quoted that scripture to me before. <laughs> I just don't remember exactly where it is. Man, what a honeymoon that would be, right? A whole year. Shoot, I never even got one day when I got married. The next day I went to work. And I've been working ever since trying to keep it going, keep the bills paid and keep food on the table. You know, that's the way my dad told me to do it. He said, that's your responsibility. But this man just got married. And uh, here's what the Bible says. And everyone who's left houses or brothers or sisters or father, mother, wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and eternal life. Now, it doesn't mean that we take off to Timbuktu and stay forever, but it means that God is first. We have our priorities straight. And everything else falls into place underneath that. And if, if your home life and your spiritual life are, are colliding, 
there's something wrong with your spiritual life. Because when you get it right, everything works. And it works better. But if you try to be balanced like the, in this age, day and age, you better not read about Paul and Jesus because they were definitely unbalanced according to this age. They were, they were overzealous for the kingdom. And you don't want to do that, Lord, no. And so they made excuses for not accepting his invitations that to come because all things are ready. Now, th th this is tragic for the Jew and the leadership. The invitation has been given. And listen, I remember what Jesus said when he gave strict orders to his apostles. Don't leave Jerusalem, but you shall be witnesses unto me. Where? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts. And they always reached out first to the Jew because they had the covenants. They had the blessing. They had the prophets of all people on earth. They should have understood. And you know, I felt sorry for them on occasion. I thought, well, Jesus came born in a stable to peasant parents. Man, how would you figure out he's God? Other than walking on water, raising the dead, casting out devils with his name, growing limbs on people, healing the sick, raising the dead, and being transfigured before Peter, James, and John. Duh. I don't know of a single person among my peers that has that testimony. None. There's never been a person like Christ that's walked upon the earth. Never. He's in a class by himself. I'll tell you why he is. He is the only begotten son of the Father, full of grace and truth. And it's, it's clear. Why did they not receive him? Work. Wealth, wife, living life. And they did not want to change how things were. And they rejected him for the same reason that people today reject Christ. And the Bible says the master that gave the feast was angry with them. And he said they will not eat a thing from this feast. There is a time when a person says no for the last time. And God says that's it. Now, you, when is that? I have no idea. But I know that when you get to that point, he shuts the door. He closed the door of the ark. And they were there banging on the door, wanting to get in, but it was too late. And you don't, you don't have forever. You have today. All things are ready now. The feast is prepared. Come and sit at the table. They made their excuses. And there's a difference between a reason and an excuse. Billy Sunday said, he called excuses the skin of a reason stuffed with a lie. The skin of a reason stuffed with a lie. I looked in the parking lot this morning and I said, why isn't our parking lot filled with people in classes studying the scriptures this morning? And I guarantee you I would get excuse after excuse. But the truth of the matter for most of us is we make that choice. We decide we're not going. And we don't go. And the same thing is true with other service times. Well, I, 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 I got to have some family time. You got seven days. Why does it have to be on Sunday? 
Why? We make a choice. But you would never tell me the real reason. I don't want to come. I don't want to go there. I don't want to do that. You see, uh, an excuse makes it possible to never, ever be accountable for the reason why we do what we do. And God doesn't, those excuses will not hold water on the day of judgment. They will go nowhere. When we begin to tell God why, he knows us so well. Now, there are reasons. The difference between a reason and an excuse, the main characteristic or distinguishing characteristic between a reason and an excuse is the issue of responsibility. Excuse is an attempt to evade full accountability for something you did or didn't do. A reason, on the other hand, is an explanation for one's actions. And there are reasons in life sometimes that we aren't able to do what we would like to do. But I'll tell you what frightens me. I'm a minister of the gospel. I have been for years. But what scares me and what I was afraid of this week is when I'm around people many times who do not believe that it is important to have a daily prayer time, you begin to ask yourself the question, is it really that critical? Couldn't I miss every once in a while? Of course you can. It's not about keeping 100%. But here's the deal. If you aren't careful, you rationalize. And you become one of those who used to. But no longer do I do that. I still remember a prominent member of the charismatic renewal who was facing terminal cancer and eventually died. But he made this confession before the cancer took him out. I have not been a man of prayer I have not waited on God. And he went down the list and talking about the fact that he had projected himself to be such, but he really was not. It scares me. It scares the life out of me. To put ourselves out as somebody that we really aren't. That's what a hypocrite is. They mask as the real thing, but they don't have the reality. That scripture that was pounded in me as a kid, they have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. In other words, they, they look like it, but there's no substance there. No substance there. And what we look like and who we are should match up. I admit to you that there are times in the schedule, I think the one trick of the enemy is to try to get us so involved in things that we never stop to have a talk with God. And that frightens me. Because I knew a pastor one time, he eventually took his own life. He pastored a large church in Florida. Some of our Floridians would know. But he learned that he had the oratorical ability to preach and not pray. And pretty soon he was carrying a gun because he had, he had some mobsters in his church. And things were not going good. And he took his own life because it got out of hand. We had, 
I was ordained in that church. I went back to that church from Maryland to be ordained before they transferred me to the Maryland district. And I remember it was a great experience, but he would be playing with the lights while we were trying to have church, dimming them, brightening them, just distractions. A pastor would know better than that. In fact, I was t- Ray Brown was talking to me about lights this week, and I wish I'd have wrote that down, Ray. You got to give me those figures. But I think he said, you know, if you're like 80, you need 20 times more light than you did when you were 20. I think there's a spiritual lesson there. We need more light. Now you see why I really wrestle with this message all night. But it's what I felt God was saying. Israel was rejected as a nation. And I don't know if God has judged us as a nation as having rejected him yet or not. If not, we have to be close. As a nation, not you and I, not a host of other people across this country that believe in God. But as a nation, we're putting God out. That's so damaging and dangerous. Nobody ever wins when they fight God. Nobody. He's too big for us. Excuses are reasons. And let's move on. That's, you know, I, I, I'm going to be everything I do now, I'm going to be examining. Is this an excuse or is this a reason? But I think it's healthy. What does God do? Extends the invitation. I feel better about my extending it now because God extended the invitation twice here. Go out and listen to what? He didn't say invite them. He said bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame. The lower class Jews, the ones that the leadership didn't want, tax collectors and sinners among Jewish people, the hated, and the poor. Luke is known for his trumping and the cause of the poor. And, and lifting them up. Go out quickly, he said, and bring them in. There are people who cannot come without someone helping them. And, you know, I've been I was telling, uh, I think I told the prayer meeting this morning, a lady was here in one of our films we showed and said, I have a sister. We've uh, been to see her. Brother Montgomery's made a call on her, and she'd like to come to church, but it takes a van with a lift on it. Because she's not able. And I thought about uh, Tommy Barnett and his church in Phoenix. They took out pews in one whole section. And it was nothing but wheelchairs lined up of people that they would bring in. And uh, someone has said, and I, I don't know who made this statement, but if you go for people that nobody else wants, God will give you the people that everybody wants. But if you're too good to, to stoop and help and bring them in, that's not convenient, is it? we got to go and get them and bring them in and take an effort to see that they're here. And they said, there's still room. And he said, go to the highways and the hedges and compel the people to come in. Go compel them. Compel is even a stronger word. It almost is a little arm twisting. And I'm told that the culture of that day, there were were a certain group of folks who would decline the first invitation, but what they really wanted you to do was to convince them that you wanted them to come. And when you compelled them to come, they would come, sort of like I used to be. When I was growing up and I would go to my buddy's house and they'd be eating and His mother knew how to fix 
roast beef like nobody I've ever eat roast beef from. And I would smell that roast beef, and they'd say, uh, why don't you come on and join us to eat? Oh, no, no. You know, my parents said, don't you go in there and start eating up their food now. No, no, no. And finally, they would say, listen. They would set up, they would fill a plate up and set it in front of me. What could I do? <laughs> I had to eat it. That's like at prime timers the other day. I, I, I saw chocolate pie. They said, so and so made it. I said, I better eat a piece of this. And I no more got that chocolate pie eaten until somebody brought brownies. And they said, have you tried one of my brownies? I said, no, I haven't. What? I immediately went to the plate, got me a brownie. And somebody else brought a pumpkin roll in. And they said, hey, do you see that pumpkin roll? What? I went over and got me a piece of pumpkin roll. I'm on a diet, folks. I had chocolate pie, pumpkin roll, and a brownie. And every one of them would knock your socks off. But listen. Listen. When I was a kid, I was so bashful and backward that I would never just go in and sit down at anybody's table. But when they prevailed on me, and you know, there are people that are just wishing. I remember when my father, I ran away from home one time. I got about a mile from the house and dad pulled up beside of me. I'd had enough time to think, where am I going? Where am I going to sleep tonight? What am I going to eat? I'm hungry. And Dad opened the car door, and he said, Son, get in. I said, Nah, Dad, I'm running away. Dad said, Get in, son. Okay, if you insist. Woo! <laughs> Praise God. Oh, it was so good. But there are people that are just waiting for somebody that really loves them, that will reach out to them. And these are not religious people. This represents the Gentiles. They didn't have the covenants. They didn't have the scriptures. They didn't have the prophets. Like we are having second and third generation unchurched kids now. And they have no background and you just can't just invite. You've got to go further and say, listen, we want you to come. Any kind of hook you can use to share the gospel with them, it's great. Yesterday, at a graveside funeral I was conducting yesterday afternoon, there was a young girl there, looked like to be, I'd say, you know, when I say young girl, don't look, don't think of 12, about 20-ish, maybe early 20s. But as I, I just preached the gospel, and she had her big NIV Bible with her. And I could tell, this is a kid that knows the Lord, sitting right beside of her with some folks that I believe needed the Lord desperately. And God wants to use us. He wants to use us. And I'm saying, God, this, I, I don't want a shouting revival that doesn't get anybody saved. I'm not interested. I've been there and done that. But I want a revival that will result in people becoming soul winners and going out in the highways and the hedges and beginning to compel people to come in and to hear the gospel story. And this is what Jesus said. He welcomed them in. Only those who accept the invitation will be at the banquet. Only those. One writer said, imagine yourself as a pauper, a beggar, bankrupt. That's what the word means. 
and you're sitting by the wayside outside the gates of a lavish mount, mansion. You see the lights in the window and the, occasionally you smell from the wind the wonderful food inside. And then all of a sudden someone comes out and says, hey, they want you to come in and join with us for lunch, for supper. You're brought inside and tenderly cared for and cleaned and with new clothes and led to the front table. And you are seated next to the master and presented with the best offering of the feast. A little later, the master announces to the guest, he's adopting you into his very own family. When seen from this perspective, the story becomes a beautiful metaphor of our relationship with God. In a spiritual sense, we are the poor and needy, astonishingly invited to a lavish banquet. God brings us from a place of deep need into his house, even into his own family. This is the core of the gospel message. And this is what we're here for is to invite people to come, to compel them to come, to earn the right, twist our arm a little bit, keep looking for reasons to invite them, and they will come. They will come if invited. A high percentage of people say, I've never been invited by anyone to go to church. If someone invited me, I would go. And this is a great time to invite people. Even Monday night. This is, this is not my favorite night of the year by far. But it's a night when we can extend a hand of friendship and fellowship and love to our community. What is that invitation? The invitation is to follow Jesus. Now, I'm going to stop before it really gets brutal in this chapter. Because if you read the rest of it, I'm going to tell you what you'll find. Except you hate father, mother, sister, brother, wife, children, even your own life. You cannot be my disciple. Now, when Jesus says that, I want to tell you how I interpret that at this point it's like no man can serve two masters you cannot serve two masters I say you cannot you'll either love one hate the other or love this one and hate this one love him less but you can't obey two masters that give you competing orders if you're going to be a true follower of Christ and you don't follow what Jesus has said, you will fall by the wayside before you arrive at your destination, before you become a true blue discipler who is discipling other people, you will have fallen by the wayside. Your family will get in the way. Your work will get in the way. Your own life will get in the way. And that's why you have to love Jesus. What's the great commandment? Love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength, everything that's in you. Love God. Love God. This morning, God invites us to his table. This is the Lord's table that we're about to partake of. And I'm going to ask you just to bow your heads for a moment. I, you don't need to confess to me, but you might need to confess to the Lord. If you're making excuses for why you do what you do or why you don't do what you should do, this morning, this is a good time 
to get out of the excuse business and just come clean with God. Oh, I, I enjoyed 714 this morning devotional. It was about being honest in your praying and telling God how you really feel. And I learned that a long time ago. But this morning, that's what God's looking for from you. Total honesty. Lord, this is where I'm at. This is what I did this morning when I prayed. Lord, you know I don't know what I'm doing. You know I don't have all the answers for this church. I don't have all the answers for one person's life in this church. I'm not the answer. You are. I don't know everything. I don't even know what I'm doing with this passage of Scripture. I've wrestled all night with it. But Lord, I'm asking you to somehow speak through me tomorrow or this morning and say exactly, I want to say exactly what you want me to say, nothing more, nothing less. Excuses mean that you're 